I want to talk about oil spills with you guys. And the lens we're going to use is the largest marine oil spill in US history. The largest marine, not the largest oil spill. People get that wrong. This is the largest marine oil spill, OK? So we're going to talk about oil spills here. So <clears throat> deep water horizon. One thing that's become very clear over the years of, of all the oil spills I've, I've looked at and, and, and projects have worked on, um, that uh, increasingly the media are playing a disproportionate role in terms of when these crises happen, they are inducing actions, they're causing different things to happen that wouldn't other that either wouldn't otherwise happen or wouldn't happen with the magnitude or the duration or what have you. This what I'm showing you here on this graph is some data we compiled. Um, the bars are the number of articles in major world newspapers, so Los Angeles Times, New York Times, London's Guardian, that kind of stuff. And then on the right are is the Google search volume for um, essentially Deepwater Horizon, Gulf oil spill, those similar terms. And so this is from uh, April, April 2010 uh, on throughout the summer. And what you see is initially there's, there are these big spikes, right? Big spikes. So this was a, you guys are, I don't know if you guys remember this whole event at the time. You guys are, um, this is starting to be several years in the past. But this was huge. This was, this was the dominant news story for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, there's all kinds of blog posts about it. There's talk show, 24-hour news cycle talking about it. There's political cartoons. There's everything. And um, it's important for you guys to understand that in this type of coastal management threat, um, the media do play a huge role. Uh, officials at BP have filed permits to once again drill for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, BP said it's easier than ever to find oil in the Gulf because most of it's now on top of the water. <laughs> they totally scoop it up and just put it in. <laughs> Good. There's, there's an oily seagull in there. Over there is not clapping. <laughs> okay, so uh, that was not right. That was a misimpression. I was also part of the pre problem. I gave misimpressions. I was using my experience from previous oil spills and applying it to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in Louisiana, and that was wrong. <clears throat> because, we worked, because we work in Louisiana, hopefully some of you guys are gonna come with us to Louisiana this spring. Um, because we work in Louisiana, when this started happening, and because I used to work on, on produce water and oil spills and stuff. Um, people started asking me, hey, what's going on? What are you doing, this and that? I was like, no, no, nothing. It, it's in Louisiana, those guys are, I, we were actually in Louisiana, my colleague John Lambrinos and I, about, about five days before the wellhead blew for an anniversary of a thing called uh, the Bro Act. But, um, and, 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 and near, near, the, near where it blew up, but um, anyway. So didn't do anything, didn't do anything. Finally, I form, we formed this, I formed this national working group to look at stuff because we were, I was worried that people were missing stuff. When we formed it, my thought was that that misimpression that Conan O'Brien just articulated, that that was the big deal. The problem was gonna be the wetlands. The problem was gonna be oiled seabirds. The problem was gonna be on the surface of the ocean and that was wrong, that was wrong. Um, so I thought we would do this. My working group were a bunch of people that I assembled that worked on oil spills, knew about oil spills, knew about Gulf Coast ecology. And the idea was not for us to get research dollars and go out in boats and sample oil, but rather to be sort of the experts from afar. And we would write some you know, little missives, memos, and white papers and things to say, hey, you guys, don't forget to do X. So we thought we would do this, which was a, a typical approach um, for, the, for the group we formed that would sort of look at fate and transportation, fate and transport of to these toxins, what it would do, which critters would be most impacted. Hey, make sure you grab these worms, don't forget about those fish, that kind of stuff. Um, we couldn't do this because it became very clear very quickly, nobody was providing any data and 
people weren't allowed to sample and collect data um, in the optimal way, I would argue. So before we get back to that, let's talk about oil spills in general. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the Gulf Coast and oil spills in general. Firstly, we, there's no such, I would argue strongly, there's no such thing as a natural disaster anymore. So in, in this case, is an oiled seabird, which everybody will show. Why? Because that's what you have to do. Doesn't matter how much the oil spill, how much oil spilled or didn't spill, got to show, show an oiled seabird. That's the law. I'll show you why that is. And we have to show something dramatic, like in this case, the Deepwater Horizon platform before it sunk uh, on fire from this Coast Guard image. The point is, we no longer have purely natural disasters. Virtually every, dis not virtually, every disaster that we have now, even if it was started by, let's say, an earthquake, even if it was started by, let's say, a hurricane, and we can talk about whether hurricanes are becoming stronger and more intense due to climate change, as they seem to be, um, but, but after that thing starts, they're made vastly more complicated by what you and I have done to the planet. And so all these things are no longer, we used to talk about man-made or human-caused disasters and natural disasters. There's, I would argue there's no distinction now. So for example, let's go to Louisiana. Here's Louisiana. This is a political map, the way we typically think of Louisiana. These are pipelines bringing uh, petroleum from primarily offshore onto onshore uh, processing facilities. These are wellheads. A lot of wellheads. That's in the ocean. Those are primarily oil, but it's oil and gas, but primarily oil. Those are primarily gas wellheads. The entirety of the state of Louisiana is blanketed by these things. This is exactly the, what, what it looks like. I mean, there are wellheads in national parks. There are wellheads in people's backyards. There are wellheads all over the place. This is a human-dominated system. Make no mistake about it. Here's another visual, visualization of the offshore wells. So here, showing you the um, a wellhead is shown by the dot. The uh, size of the bubble is how deep into the water the, the wellhead starts. And then the color represents the time. So the lightest color were the oldest drilled wells going to the dark, which are the newer drilled wells. And then the red diamond there is, is the, where the deep water, the Macondo well, where the deep water horizon um, spill happened. So what pattern do you guys see to that? Good, exactly, right. So we started off early, the white ones, close to shore, right? Why? That was easier. Didn't need as much boat, didn't need as much drilling capacity, right? Just it's shallow water. And then as we sucked that oil out, we had to go a little bit farther, and then a little bit farther, and then a little bit farther. So as we've been going, we've been going deeper and deeper and farther and farther offshore. Good. It's important to say that this is not a unique phenomenon for the Gulf. This is happening across the planet. We've basically got the easy oil. We captured that easy resource. So increasingly to get what what's remains, we have to go farther and farther afield. And typically that means farther and farther to see, out to sea or in more crazy ocean conditions like the Arctic or the North Sea or drill incredible depths. So in this case, this is just in the immediate wake of the Deepwater Horizon. These are the, this is the Brazilian uh, oil company um, that is going after these, this oil underneath the, these phenomenal depths that are underneath these massive salt domes that are themselves way deep underwater. So this is a mobile, this is a, a drilling platform that's being barged out to sea. So this notion of deep water drilling is becoming the norm in offshore oil drilling. Also, uh, simply extracting oil is not the only thing. As we've already talked about, we've talked about deep sea mining already, right? But that's another aspect of the same thing. Go, you, we used to think down deep, incredible pressures, incredible distances. Logistically, we can't do anything. As you guys now know, we have robotic technology. We have other 
incredible engineering feats of engineering that allow us to get to these previously non-exploited resources, we can get to them. Okay, let's talk about the Gulf of Mexico for a second. Uh, just to, to make sure everybody's on the same page, about five years before the, the Deepwater Horizon blew out, we had Hurricane Katrina. This is when Hurricane Katrina was coming in and when she was a Category 5. By the time she made landfall, she was actually a Category 3. By the time she was in Lake Pontchartrain, which you guys will see if you guys come with us, uh, it was actually a Category 1 storm. So when the city of New Orleans flooded, that was a Category 1 storm. It was not this incredible, giant, massive superstorm that everybody said, well, there's no possible way we can defend against that. The defenses were supposed to protect the city up to at least a Category 3, and they did not. Um, just a little illustration of that. So here comes Hurricane Katrina. Boom, boom, boom. The eye is forming, tightens up, becomes a Category 5 right about here, and whoa. The city of New Orleans, for you guys who don't know, this is Lake, Lake Pontchartrain. The city of New Orleans is right about there. So this hurricane was just about, uh, it, was, it was almost perfectly the worst possible track to, to harm the city of New Orleans in 2005. And it's important to say that, again, as lead up to this, we've been Swiss cheesing the wetlands of Louisiana in a hardcore way, primarily because of our levying of the Mississippi River and the severing of the sediment supply into the wetlands that act to balance out normal loss or, or normal erosion or normal subsidence of the marsh. We have the seasonal pulse of sediment that gets dumped on the top that keeps the land at about the same level. We severed that in the mid part of the last century because we were afraid of water and we wanted to control water. Um, so we were already losing wetlands and then we have things like Hurricane Katrina that comes in and so to, to give you guys a reference, this is a some of the Chandelier Islands, which are off the coast. This is hard for a lot of we Californians to understand. This is a barrier island system. We don't have barrier islands here. These are sand islands, shallow. The, the coastal shelf there is shallow. So sediment builds up, and it acts as essentially a speed bump. So in this case, the island chain in the middle, the island thing in the middle, the, the essentially open ocean is to the right. And the back side of it is what all that colored stuff is. So it's basically a beach, sandy beach in front. Then it goes to a sandy dune community. And then in the back, it's a, oftentimes a marsh, a, a, a wetland type of situation. The images on the top and the, the orange lines show you where we took these photos. So the, the image on the top and the, and the yellow arrows are for reference at the same point in time. So the above photos are from before Hurricane Katrina, in this case in 2001. And the bottom photos in the immediate wake of Hurricane Katrina come through, ripped out all that wetland, right? So our wetlands have been, we've been losing marsh just every day, day in, day out. And then we have things like Hurricane Katrina that act to jump us forward 50 or 100 years in terms of the loss rate um, outside of those storms. Um, in addition to doing all the damage to people and structures, Hurricane Katrina, people don't realize this, release a massive amount of oil. Hurricane Katrina was an insane oil spill. All this huge array of and ten, that's 10 major spills, hundreds and hundreds of small spills, released a massive volume of petroleum into the neighborhoods and waterways of southern Louisiana. Um, it destroyed 46 platforms, like completely destroyed 46 platforms and damaged another 20 others. This was a, so Hurricane Katrina was a huge release of petroleum. And then we, who knows how many point sources, at least 100,000, at least. Crazy. And, and there's, here's a quote I have from the um, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, the, the, what we would call the, the equivalent would be the EPA or the Natural Resources um, Commission uh, here in California. And so it says, uh, they said in a press conference, everywhere we look, there's a spill. It all adds up. There's almost a sheen, a solid sheen over the entire area right now. And so I estimate that this is something like 260,000 barrels. That's very, 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 very likely an underestimate, but, but something on that order of magnitude. So hundreds of thousands of barrels of oils released. You never hear about that, right? 
We hear about the effect on people. We hear about the effect of infrastructure. We never hear about the oil released, or, or rarely, um, from the deep from uh, Hurricane Katrina. Okay, let's step back a little bit farther and talk about oil spills broadly writ. Let's put Deepwater Horizon into reference. So you guys, you guys should make sure you get these numbers down for scale. So first, look at the bottom of the slide. So one ton of crude oil is equivalent to 308 US gallons, which is equal to 7.33 barrels. That gets confusing. It's easy to remember one barrel equals 42 US gallons. So one barrel, 42 gallons. And the barrel is the, is the international unit that we talk about in terms of selling oil, buying oil, purchasing oil, selling oil, moving oil, all that stuff. So we talk about barrels. We usually abbreviate barrels, the unit barrels, as BBL or BBLS. Okay, so one barrel, 42 gallons. So let's have a look at that. We'll, we'll talk more about this, but the Deepwater Horizon, and so this is, I, just to be clear, I'm using the scientific data. The federal judge adjudicating the Deepwater Horizon used a slightly lower number, but not a scientist. We go with the best estimate, which is this thing called the flow rate technical group. More on that later. Basically, a group of experts that came together to try to figure out how much oil was flowing out every day from the wellhead. So we get about uh, 4.9 million barrels, or if you prefer gallons, 208.5 million gallons of oil released. That's a huge amount of oil. But you don't know what that means, right? You don't, you don't have any scale yet, so I'm going to show you that. But first, stop what you're writing and look at me. Whenever something like this happens, and I strongly suspect this might be even more so the case in the upcoming years, you need to question the units that people are using. People that have an interest will change their units to try to convince you of something. So a barrel, so if we have 42 gallons, that's one barrel. What you will typically hear is the industry say, oh, we spilled a barrel of oil. What you'll hear the environmental groups say is they spilled 42 barrels of oil, 42 gallons of oil, right? It's the same thing, but one sounds a lot more, right? So you, sh you need to be very um, careful in these issues. If we're talking about oil moving, if we're, you know, so many different things, water moving, what are the units? And what is the person using those units trying to push? The other thing is, what you'll hear uh, that, that I suspect is going to become increasingly a political football, numbers, quantity versus relative amounts, percentage, right? And so, again, groups will use, it's not as if, I'm not saying accusing people of lying necessarily, but people will absolutely try to sculpt your view. They'll try to pick whatever the unit is that has the largest number if that serves their purpose, or they'll pick the unit that makes the number the smallest if that suits their purpose. So you should be more sophisticated than that and, and have an eye towards, towards what's going on. So let's have a look here. So the Deepwater Horizon, 4.9 million barrels. <clears throat> the um, biggest oil release was, maybe even before a lot of you guys were born, um, the 1991, the first Gulf War, the first Gulf War. So if you guys don't remember that, what basically happened was Saddam Hussein, well, there's a whole long history, but to jump forward, Saddam Hussein invades the neighboring country of Kuwait, basically because he wants their oil. He's slant drilling, so there's all these problems with people slant drilling, drilling wells outside of their geographic territory, and it gets everybody angry, and long story short, they invade. They take over the country. They do a bunch of horrible war crimes and horrible, horrible stuff. Uh, George Bush's father, George Herbert Walker Bush, forms a coalition, goes to stages in Saudi Arabia outside of Kuwait, and then invades Kuwait, drives the Iraqi military forces back. 
in the process, the, um, the retreating Iraqi folks dynamite the oil fields. They blow up the oil fields. They set some intentionally on fire. So they make this insane black smoke that satellites can't see through. So it's basically cover. They, bo they booby trap a lot of the oil uh, uh, wellheads and others they just dynamite. So there are lakes of oil that form. There's fires that burn for months. Um, I mean, it was, it was like literally a hell on earth landscape. Um, so surprisingly, we don't have good numbers of how much oil was released because it was a war zone, right? People are shooting each other, killing each other. Because there's so much soot and smoke went up in the air, we don't even have good satellite photos in the early days. Some of this was released directly onto sand, which then just, you know, sand is super porous. It just kind of dribbled back in. Others went into the water, uh, other portions. So it's, it's been very hard. So the number I'm using here is from this United Nations study. And the best estimate is something like six to nine um, uh, million barrels released, right? Which is something like 120 to 160 percent of what the deep water horizon was. Um, and that's just the stuff that's on the surface. Okay, so the Kuwait oil field release, which is partly marine, partly freshwater lake, partly land, it's kind of all over the whole landscape, whole, the whole territory. But that, that's a huge one. The next one that is probably most recognizable to you is the 1989 Exxon Valdez spill. That happened when I was an undergrad. I was in your guys' shoes. Uh, right. So that was a tanker in Alaska that had gas. So drilling in the north slope of Alaska, then we put it in the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. That crude comes down through, over land through the middle of Alaska, dumps out on the southerly ports uh, on, on the south side of uh, the state of Alaska, load up into tankers, and those tankers come down to California and elsewhere. And this gentleman uh, basically was alcoholic. And he was supposed to be captaining. He went down, his, and, and the vessel um, basically ran aground, tore open the side of the vessel, and released this large volume of oil into um, the sound there. So that's about 15% of what the Deepwater Horizon was. Another one that we'll, we'll touch on is Ixtoc One. That's a Mexican oil platform at sea that has a rupture. This happens in um, 1979, and it releases about 3.5 million barrels, which is about 70% of the Exxon spill, but it's relatively shallow. It's in diving depth. <clears throat> uh, then uh, the most important oil spill that you need to know about, and we'll talk about this in, in a few minutes, this 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. So this defines every single thing we've done since. Incredibly important for coastal marine management. And that was that spilled 2% of the Deepwater Horizons oil. Uh, the Torrey Canyon, which was our, the world's first big super tanker, uh, ran aground um, when somebody was basically trying to cut a corner. Uh, off, and, um, off of England, and uh, they released about 15% of the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil. And then the largest U.S. oil spill, the Lakeview Gusher, in, Kern, in, in, in inland from us, inland from us. So you guys can get there in about an hour from our campus. Um, that was the largest oil spill in U.S. history. That was about 180%, so not quite 200% the release of the Deepwater Horizon. That's the largest U.S. oil spill. Okay? Everybody cool? Questions? We're going to talk about some of these now. So again, I'm not saying I'm going to give you guys a quiz that asks this question, but I might give you a quiz that asks the question, what's the largest U.S. oil spill? And what's the answer? Lakeview Gusher, thanks. Is, what's Deepwater Horizon? It's the largest marine oil spill. Okay, great. So this happened, so this happened uh, almost exactly 100 years to the day of the Deepwater Horizon. 
crazy. We've come so far in a, in a century. This is a picture from back then. So this is in current, this is basically near Bakersfield. This is if you guys go up to, you guys know Button Willow? You know where that is? Bottom of the grapevine? If you're on five and you're going through the grapevine, then you drop down in the central valley, right? Drop down the flat plains. It's basically right there, or very close to there. So, um, uh, this is oil that you're looking at. This is it looks like a river. It's not a river of water. It's a river of petroleum. This created lakes that were 30 meters deep of oil. I mean, this is this is crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. So these are all pictures. So these guys that are paddling, these, are on a, these guys are on a lake of oil. I should say all these photos come from uh, the Kern County Oil Museum, awesome museum. I would love for you guys to go there. It is super cool. It's run by all these crazy old blue, blue haired ladies that are the sweetest folks in the world. They're great. They sit around, they don't have, nobody goes there and they love to talk and show you around. It's awesome. You guys would totally dig it. Um, and they have a lot of fantastic old photos, and that's where I've obtained all of my photos of, from Lakeview Gusher. Um, so uh, these guys are drilling. This is back in the day when we do hand drilling. And uh, essentially, everybody's striking it rich. So there will be blood. Has anybody seen that movie? Yeah. That's based on essentially what this, this era in, in eastern Ventura County and Kern County. It's fictionalized. But the, the broad strokes are what was happening, right? It was strike it rich, right? These are hand drilling operations mostly. Boom, boom. And essentially just taking a chunk of steel and, and letting gravity drop it into the ground. And, and you know, digging, picking, and, and, and you know, very primitive drilling. Uh, short version is these guys are digging, digging, digging. And all of a sudden, they hit this oil, and it starts to blurb up, right? It, it rockets in the air, and they're like, great, we're going to be so rich. And it doesn't stop for over a year. So it burbles, 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 starts to have the ground around it collapse. It forms this bigger and bigger crater. These guys are, whoa, it's not stopping. Uh, whoa, it's not stopping. So then they start to sandbag it, and the thing just continues to grow. They try everything. They throw railroad uh, cars into it. They throw cement, they throw boulders, they throw all this stuff, nothing. They build a rail spur for off the line from Los Angeles. So tourists go out there because it's, 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 like it's, it's like Old Faithful if Old Faithful just went continuously, right? And if the wind was blowing the right way, passengers would drop the windows and look out and, and, and look at the oil. If the wind was blowing the wrong way, they had to have the, the windows up because the, the uh, Rail, rail cars would be covered in oil mist, oil sheen. This was crazy. They could not figure out how to stop it. Ultimately, it stopped because we purged the entirety of that oil reserve, that reservoir, and the pressure just equalized and it stopped burbling on its own. There was, people had no way to stop it. Again, a year of flowing oil. Uh, they harvested some of it, but it's, it's, it's hard to know how much they harvested. Um, also, hard to know the exact ecological footprint. That's about all we know from the deep water, from the uh, Lakeview Gusher. There were no scientists out there studying oil toxicity at the time. This is an area, if you guys go out there now, you'll see it. If you go out there now, you'll find a, a, a skanky pla plaque and an old chunk of metal in the, in the ground. That's it. A bunch of beer bottles, kids out there drinking on the weekends. You would think it would be this really interesting historical site. And it is, it is, a, it is a historical site, but it's, it's like some br broken down thing by the side of the road. You would never know that was the largest oil spill site in all of the US and one of the largest in the world ever. Um, so they harvested some. The ecological footprint, though, is very difficult to tell because there are oil wells across the entirety of the area. There, is oil, there are oil spills all over the whole thing. So it's hard to see an ecological signal of what they did. Um, and uh, yeah, it was crazy times, crazy times. Okay, that's the Lakeview Gusher. Let's jump forward now to talk about the, um, 
Santa Barbara oil spill. Santa Barbara oil spill, 1969. We're drilling uh, off of the, uh, the coast. I should, I should say Summerland, which is right near here. Summerland was the site of the first offshore oil drillings anywhere in the world. So Louisiana likes to think that they did it. They, they didn't. People actually put a pier off of Summerland and put a terrestrial drilling platform just in shallow water. And then they started, then they do it, did that a bunch. That was the first uh, offshore oil drilling in the US. Oil platform, drilling, 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 drilling. Let's see, do I have a, yeah, okay. So um, what I'll, before I tell you exactly what happened, I'll just show you guys some images. So this was, uh, there's a couple themes that emerged. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. A couple themes that emerged from this oil spill. One, it's totally insane. It's massive. We can't control it. Our technology doesn't work to stop the flow of oil. What you're seeing here is, what you're seeing up, up above right here, this is a U-2 spy plane photo that at the time maybe did or didn't exist. There were no satellites to image stuff. So President Nixon had to task this spy plane to fly over and take images on film camera to get a sense of the scale of the spill. We didn't have anything to sense it. Here you see on the lower left, these guys in Santa Barbara Harbor scraping up oil off the surface by hand. Here you see on the right, guys throwing bales of straw, bales of hay on the beach to, so the oil sucks up in the straw, then they fork up the straw and take it to a landfill. Really? That's maybe not the most effective way. Uh, and then this, the this threat of environmental impact. So on the right, you're seeing this, this vet piloting what we now do all the time, which is trying to rescue birds that have, been they have oil alighted on the surface or, or on the beach and, and got oil on their feathers and trying to clean them with detergent, We're trying to clean these birds with detergent. We know now that the traditional way of doing that is, doesn't really work, and most of these birds are going to die anyway because they've ingested, they already have all this oil on them and they try to preen themselves, clean themselves, clean their feathers as they would normally do if their feathers were, were dirty, but they ingest a huge amount of oil. So a lot of times, unless you get the birds early, it doesn't, I mean, it cleans the outside, but they're oftentimes poisoned. And that was the case in this case. And then uh, if you're, if you're went to school in Santa Barbara, like I did, this is, this is the, what I call the trifecta, the worst of all possible things. So there's, Seabird, so the environment's messed up. There's oiled kelp there, so not just the, not just the terrestrial air-dwelling critters, but the ocean-dwelling critters are screwed up. The ocean is t contaminated, and then this, the the surfboard is full of oil. All right, so it's screwing up all aspects of life. And then we have the then president, and this was uh, uh, we don't the company's merged, but it used to be called Union Oil that owned plat th this particular platform that blew. And so Fred Hartley says, uh, it, speaking in the harbor in Santa Barbara to a bunch of reporters after the spill's been going on for a couple days, I don't, I don't like to call it a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds. Completely out of touch. The industry representative, industry executive, leader of his company doesn't, wow, why do people care? And all of these threads come together to produce this massive media and firestorm and public outrage. It's hard for you guys to understand how up in arms things were. So for example, um, what? So uh, here, uh, this induces the president to consider a permanent ban on drilling. Maybe we hear that, maybe we hear that later on. Uh, this, 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 is actually the, this is actually the start of it. So here's the Los Angeles time. Big white desert, snow leaves, northwest Nam. Da, 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 da. Oh, and then over here is, uh, oh yeah, we had an oil platform blow out. So the first couple days, we don't really 
get it, and then rapidly it starts to become this huge, giant story. Um, president does nothing. President does nothing. I mean, what can the president do, right? I mean, I mean, he's, it, he, he can't really do much. But eventually the pressure mounts so much, what does he do? He has to come to the beach. Has to come down to the beach. Walk around, kick the sand, look like he's doing something, right? Where have you seen that happen? Every single time ever since. Uh, here's a bunch of women that are protesting the, um, the, uh, the spill, and then they eventually get naked to draw attention. This is the Santa Barbara airport. So it, this is like, what? It, it's just becoming media circus, 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 circus. Here is the local high school, San Marcos High. They were doing a, uh, whatever the heck play they were, and then the oil spill happened. They threw that, threw that out, and they wrote their own play. They wrote a melodrama. And the, if you look at this, the, the melodrama is the evil oil company, right? The oily bad guy is coming after the poor little Barbara, the poor little Santa Barbara, right? So on every which way you want to pick, it was, it was crazy, right? It was crazy. Everybody was just insane and, and just couldn't believe that this kept happening and happening and happening. So this happened, the primary spill the primary spill happened starting on January 28th um, and went for 11 days. But really, we had diffuse flow for at least a year. But the main, like, glob, 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 huge volumes of oil was primarily over the first uh, two weeks. What happened was bad engineering. What happened was poor geological understanding. What happened was poor regulation that allowed an unsafe practice to go forward. So, um, we'll, okay, so these guys drill a hole into the, into the rock to get to the pocket of oil down below. And then we sheath, we, we put a, a steel straw around that hole to make sure it doesn't collapse, to make sure it doesn't break and fracture. And the the oil company basically says, hey, do we, have to, do we have to encapsulate the entirety of our well bore, the entirety of the core, all the way down to the oil pocket? And the regulators at the time say, uh, no, just go to, like the, to the top part of it. Well, what happened was the ground was, was crackable. The, 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 the substrates were crackable. And essentially, they started to crack, and they started to get oil bubbling, coming out the sides. Essentially, not the tube, not where they could harvest it, but just in the water around. The guys realize it. They start to, they start to try to plug it. The way you plug an oil well is you throw what's called mud in there. You throw a bunch of sediment and, 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 and silt and stuff down in the well hole, and then you put cement on top of that, and, and they just try to jam more stuff in there and essentially plug up the straw, right? They put too much stuff in, and when they try to jam that, plug that hole, because the tube wasn't sheathed in that steel case, it cracked it even further. So, um, so right, only 7% of the length of that well bore was, was armored, was, was cased. And so, so that's what happened. Okay, we, we mentioned the media circus, amongst other things, this is one, this is not the only thing. People from Santa Barbara would have you believe this is the only thing. This wasn't the only thing, but this was a massively important thing um, that drives the modern environmental movement, which was already nascent. This, at the same time, there was this fire in the Cuyahoga River in Ohio that also did it. People said, Should the, does, does water normally burn? Hmm, maybe that's not a good thing. So there were other things other than just the Santa Barbara oil spill, but the Santa Barbara oil spill was incredibly important. Right? It probably wasn't in and of itself sufficient, but it was, it was one of the key drivers. Um, uh, and, and, and really drives the, the modern environmental movement. Everybody always cites Earth Day, which starts in the wake of this. Actually, it started in Michigan and then, and then spread, but still um, incredibly important. All of our modern environmental laws that we think of as our powerful environmental laws, Clean Water Act, uh, Nas National Environmental Protection Act, um, all that stuff, uh, all that stuff come in the wake of the Endangered Species Act, all come in the wake of this spill. 
people say, we've gone too far, things are too crazy, let's create, uh, <laughs> uh, they, they did not say, <laughs> did not say let's put an insane person in charge to solve the problem. They actually said let's get together and talk and come up with some reasoned tools to, to constrain activities that we don't think are desirable. And that's how we got our modern environmental uh, laws. It also importantly <coughs> set up this narrative that we have been stuck with, that we've been saddled with ever since. And I would argue a not, not necessarily productive um, narrative. That narrative is this. There's the greedy, evil oil company versus the poor widow birds. Or, depending on how it's phrased, the greedy oil company against the not-in-my-backyard enviros that will drive their big, giant cars, but they don't want to have any oil extracted next to their houses. So those two narratives, but really especially the first one, have characterized our interaction with this type of resource management challenge ever since. We see a lot of poisoning. It's oil. It's oil on things, right? Oil, 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 oil. Oil's bad. We see in particular high toxicity with seabirds, high toxicity to marine mammals, and high toxicity to critters in the rocky intertidal, things that are attached and the oil is continually washing on to them and killing them. Those are what everybody focuses on. In the wake of this, uh, the University of Southern California, when they used to do marine science, you know, anymore, but when they used to, um, uh, they had a great group there and they did a study and they looked at why, it's in the wake of this, hey, why, oh, okay, and then people said, the world's gonna end. The world's gonna end, the world's gonna end, the world's gonna end. Uh, all fishing's gonna stop, all this and that. And then afterwards, all fishing didn't stop. So the question was, why? You know, what happened? And the answer was this. This is also what we have been saddled with ever since, since 1969. So the first thing is, hey, what's going on here in this, in this uh, oil uh, rich area? Well, the eukaryotes have evolved oil tolerance because things have just grown up here. So the critters that live here, they can handle a little bit of oil. It's cool. You ever been on the beach? Lots of tar. That tar was there before we ever started drilling oil. That's been here for thousands and thousands of years and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. So, you know, so the critters that are here, they just deal with it. They're cool. They can handle it. The microbial life, those guys actually are really good at eating oil. So goes the narrative. So it's cool. Don't worry about it. They'll eat all the oil. It's cool. Next, we had a couple storms. So this is what would happen. What happened is we'd have all this oil wash up on the shore, and these guys would go clean it up, clean it up, and they're like, oh, phew, got it all. And then a day or so later, another wave of oil dump on the shore. Start all over again. And they clean that up. Like, okay, we got it. And then oil wash up on the shore. And people were getting frustrated. Um, we had two storms come through the area at that time, and that broke up the slicks. So people said, oh, it wasn't as bad as we thought because the, the oil got um, uh, mushed up. The other thing they said was, um, actually, it was cool. We didn't have as many bad consequences because the oil was mostly heavy. We have mostly asphalt. So we have mostly thick, heavy oils here in the Santa Barbara Channel. Um, not the light cruise, not, it's not like gasoline, it's more like tar. And so it was, it's relatively dense, and so it, it sunk. So just to be clear, it's not a problem because it sunk off, off the surface of the, uh, of the area. You might ask, well, what happened to the water column and the critters at the bottom of the ocean? But nobody else asked that question. So this is the story as to why the Santa Barbara oil spill didn't have a massive, long-lasting ecological footprint that we might otherwise suspect. <clears throat> the critters are cool with it, not cool with it, but the critters have, have evolved with this, so they're okay, don't stress. There's always natural oil seeps, don't worry about it. Number two, oh yeah, breaking up the, surface, the oil on the surface, that's a good thing. And then two, hey, just get it off of the surface of the water and, and that'll be a really good thing. 